What an honor. Thank you. I appreciate this. How many of you were not here last year when I spoke? Oh, goodness, that's a lot. So I've asked the pastor before if you warned them about me. Did you? <laughs> I know I don't look like a minister. I don't sound like one. I don't even sound like an adult, much less. <laughs> but God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? I think he just he chooses people to just show you that, dear God, if she can do it, there's hope for all of us, right? So I don't know if any of you follow us on Instagram, but it was a journey to get here. Um, I'm from Dallas, but I was in Los Angeles yesterday, and we were supposed to go L.A. to Chicago, Chicago to Grand Rapids. We got to Chicago, and they said it was going to be a six-hour delay, and I would have gotten here at midnight. So we decided to just jump in an Uber and drive from Chicago to here. <laughs> and the Uber driver said, I'm going to stop in Indiana and get gas. I was like, Indiana? Like, we were all over the United States yesterday. So I finally got to my room at 9 o'clock after traveling for like 12 hours. And then my mom was watching my journey, and she was like, honey, do you have your stuff? I said, mom, I don't even have my luggage. And she, because it was on the fly, you know. So I said, but mama, I got my notes and I got my makeup. So my... <laughs> My life may not be perfect, but my lashes will be. So, <laughs> but hey, the luggage showed up at midnight. So we, we got it, right? So I'm so excited to be with y'all. And I do want to share a message with you. I'm calling this the five keys to live your dreams. I'm a cheerleader of dreams. And I like to just stir up the dream that's on the inside of you. Does that sound good? Because some of you are probably looking at me like, is this a joke? But... What I want to share with you is not only the keys to live your dreams, but to accelerate your progress. See, I believe what should take five years, God can do it in one year. And I don't just say this because, you know, I found a message on Google or on YouTube. This is something I've studied from God's Word. I've applied it to my life, and I've seen it happen. So, you know, Dave Ramsey says, if you want to be successful, study successful people. You want to be skinny, study skinny people. You want to be rich, study rich people, right? Well, I like to study people and see the results they're getting. And I was listening to a message by John Maxwell. Some of you know who John Maxwell is? He's one of my mentors. And he was hosting a conference where he agreed to do a Q&A at the end. Well, there was this young kid there who had just graduated with an MBA and he was just admiring everything about this conference. So I want you to just imagine there are 2,000 people in attendance who paid $2,000 each. Okay, I'm just gonna grab my pocket calculator and do some math, okay? <laughs> so 2,000 times $2,000, that's $4 million in one weekend. So this kid stood up and he said to John Maxwell, I wanna do what you do. Maxwell said, what do you think I do? He said, well, you speak at these events, you write best-selling books, you impact lives. He said, I want to do what you do. And John Maxwell said, young man, it's not a matter of doing what I do. He said, the question is, do you want to do what I did so you can do what I do? Now, here's my point. You can't have a million-dollar dream with minimum wage habits. You can't have a million-dollar dream with minimum wage habits, right? So this kid said, well, I want to lead a company. I want to lead a department or a team. He said, where do I start? You know what Maxwell said? Good question. Start with you. He said, if you wouldn't follow yourself, why would anyone else want to follow you? Now, the only reason I'm telling you this, I'm not trying to be mean, is that this is what God had to gently hammer into me. When I was going through the worst time in my life, I was separated from my husband. I had no vision for my life. Everything was a mess. Jesse Duplantis said to my face, y'all know who Jesse is? He said to my face, he said, Terry, don't look at Rodney. Don't look at your problems. He said, you work on you. And I began to work on myself. And as I began to grow, everything around me began to grow. Now, I'm telling you this because I believe Joel 2.25, that scripture says, that God can restore the years that have been stolen. Some of you feel like you've wasted a lot of years. God can restore those years. And that's exactly what happened in my life. So let me give you a little, a little background real quick. Um, 
You know, I'm, I'm so grateful for what God has done in my life and in our ministry. Um, I left my dad's ministry, Jerry Savelle Ministries, uh, seven and a half years ago. And seven and a half years, God has accelerated so much, so fast. Our YouTube channel has over 30 million views now. Um, YouTube honored us with the Silver Play Award for reaching 100,000 subscribers. Now we're getting close to a quarter of a million. I've written 13 books. Last year, we shipped resources to 114 nations. Now, I'm not saying that to, to brag or to sound like I'm showing off. The reason I'm telling you that is to appreciate what God has done, you have to know the backstory. So real quick, just to summarize this, um, you know, I grew up in such a strong word of faith home. Like I told you, my dad's Jerry Savelle. Some of you know him. And I was, um, I was a cheerleader all through school. I was even the homecoming queen. I even dated the quarterback. But I was hiding so much pain behind a big smile. At 14 years old, I was raped by a guy that I didn't even know. I was at a fitness center at a gym. Never dreamed in a million years I would lose my virginity on a gym floor by a complete stranger. And have you ever heard that phrase that you behave in a manner consistent with how you see yourself? If you see yourself as worthless, you'll let people treat you like you're worthless. Well, after that experience, I thought I was ugly. I thought I was fat. I thought I was worthless. And so I started letting people treat me like that. I got into a relationship with a guy that became abusive, and I stayed with him for two and a half years because of how I felt about myself. I mean, everything from him strangling me, dragging me across the grass, locking me in a car, banging my head on a steering wheel, and I stayed with him because of how worthless I felt. Finally, got out of that relationship, and my senior year of college at Texas Tech University, I, was, I got pregnant before marriage. My last semester, I got pregnant before marriage. And I felt like the biggest failure, the biggest loser, the biggest regret of the Savelle family. I thought I'm going to be the biggest disgrace of our family. I'm going to ruin my dad's ministry. And I was laying in my floor in Lubbock, Texas with my journal, and I was just scribbling, I want to die. And I even told my roommates, I said, I can't bear to tell my parents what I've done. I'm just going to run away. I said, I'm just going to head west. And my roommate, Teresa, said, no, you're not. You don't even know which way's west. She said, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> but she said, we're going to get through this. Three weeks after I found out I was pregnant, I got married. Borrowed my sister's wedding dress. Three weeks after the wedding, I lost the baby. So you can imagine. I just felt like a big loser. I've ruined my life. Years went by, like years. And I was at a convention, a Kenneth Copeland convention years ago, and Oral Roberts walked in. You remember the famous preacher, Oral Roberts? He walked in. He stood on the front row right in front of me. And my dad said, Mr. Roberts, you remember my daughter, Terry? He turned around, gave me a hug. And because it was Oral Roberts, all the TV cameras were on him. There's like 10,000 people in this arena. Well, all of a sudden, Oral Roberts looked at me in front of everybody, and my face is on the jumbo screens, and he said, there's something you're not letting go of. Oh, I actually brought the picture to show y'all if you can see this. Someone took a picture and sent it to me, but he said, there's something you're not letting go of. And I just stood there so humiliated in front of all these people, and then he told me to lift my arms. So I raised my arms and he started hitting my elbows and yelling, let go, let go, let go. And I'm just standing there thinking, of what? I literally had no idea. <clears throat> well, finally, <clears throat> the Lord showed me that it was the shame of my past. It was the guilt, the shame, the memories, and not only that, but the bad habits that had led me to where I was. So y'all, <clears throat> I began practicing what I'm going to share with you today that literally transformed my entire life. I mean, as I began to grow, everything around me began to grow. My career, my relationships, my salary, my opportunities, everything grew as I began to grow. So do y'all want to hear this real quick? Okay. Y'all doing good? Okay. I wasn't asking for a hand clap. I just wanted to make sure you were ready. Okay. 
I call this the five C's, actually, to live your dreams. The first C is clarity. Clarity. And what I mean by this is get clear on what you want. You know, Mark Twain's the one who said, I can teach anybody how to get what they want in life. Problem is, I can't find anybody who can tell me what they truly want. You know, I think about Kenneth Hagin. I know I shared this with y'all before, how he said he would see people praying at the altar, and he would just gently tap them on the shoulder, and he'd say, sweetheart, what are you praying about? What are you praying for? He said so many times people would say, oh, nothing in particular. He'd say, then that's exactly what you're going to get, nothing in particular. You've got to get crystal clear on what you're believing God for <clears throat> and what you're asking God for. Now, some of you may remember <clears throat> my giant pencil. You remember this? The reason I take my texas size pencil is because God is the one who said, write the vision, make it plain. Now, successful people have stumbled upon this principle. Jim Carrey, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Steve Harvey, Oprah Winfrey, they all do this but it came from God's word. Habakkuk 2.2 says, write the vision, make it plain on paper, right? Now, do y'all remember the story of the professor at Virginia Tech who did research on successful people and goal setting? He said he walked up to random people and he just asked them one question. He said, what are your goals? He said 80% of the people he asked said, I don't know, I don't have any goals. 16% said, I have goals, but I've never written them down. 3% said, I've written my goals at some point, but I don't know where they are. 1% said, I have goals, I've written them down, and I review them on a consistent basis. He said, do you know who the 1% were? Millionaires. Every one of them were millionaires. And the clues these millionaires gave us, number one, I have goals. Number two, I don't leave them in my head. I actually take the time to write them down. And number three... I'm constantly looking at them. So when I began to learn this at the worst time in my life, I thought, I can do this. If Jim Carrey can do this and get results, how much more can we as believers do what God said to do and get results, right? So I started writing things like I put a picture of school buildings and I said, my resources are in schools across America teaching young people how to get a vision for their lives. So I put a picture of buildings. I put a picture of um, the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. And I said, I minister to the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. I put a picture of France, a map of France. And I said, my, my resources are translated in French and I'm impacting the French people. Oh, thank you. That was sweet. Do you have a cupcake? <laughs> um, I just got a little hungry, but... Um, <laughs> So I put a picture of um, Italy, of the Amalfi Coast, and I said, I'm enjoying my 50th birthday on a trip to Italy. I put a picture, now this was when I first got started. I put a fake picture of me, y'all can't see this, but it's a little picture of me preaching with my heroes. And I said, I speak at events with people I respect and admire. I put John Maxwell, Les Brown, Lisa Bevere, people like that. Let me just remind you, I taught you this last year, there's a principle in God's word that you become what you behold. Whatever you keep before your eyes, it will eventually show up in your life. Is it coincidental that here are my resources in schools teaching young people how to dream? Not one bit, is it? Is it coincidental I'm ministering to the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders or that our books are in French or... Here I am speaking at events with John Maxwell and Les Brown. That's not coincidental at all, is it? Because when the vision is clear, the results will appear. So I'm telling you from experience, get clear on what you want. Don't say this year we're getting out of debt. How much debt do you have? Get a picture of it. Write the vision. Say, I declare by faith we are debt-free, $17,456.72. Now that's a clear vision, isn't it? In fact, I remember hearing Creflo Dollar say, if Jesus himself showed up in your living room tonight and said, how much money do you need to get out of debt? He said, if you can't answer him, you're not serious about getting out of debt. Well, when I began to hear those things, I thought, I'm going to get serious about it. I'm going to get clear. So I would put a picture of my MasterCard bill and say, thank you, Jesus. My MasterCard is paid in full, $3,456. 
get clear. Does this make sense? Clarity is one of the single most important keys to success. Okay, number two, the second C is confession. Confession. You know, Romans 4.17 says that we are to call those things that be not as though they are, right? My favorite translation, it says, same scripture, but it says we serve a God who gives life to the dead, and he speaks of non-existent things as if they exist. So y'all know that this is how you release your faith is with the words of your mouth, right? You can't just put a picture of what you're believing, car, believing for and just expect it to appear. No, you have to call those things that be not as though they are. And you know, like I told you, I study successful people, which it amazes me how the world, the business world, has stumbled upon this principle. Like I told you before, Lady Gaga does this. Conor McGregor does this. Will Smith does this. But they don't know, some of them don't know, that it came from God's word. So God's the one that told us, release your faith, speak to your dreams, command them, prophesy your future, right? So I wanted to tell you this story real quick. I was just studying um, the power of words, and I wrote a whole book called The Language of Success, Pep Talk. And there was this um, scientist who was studying words, the power of words, and he wanted to just see, is this really true that there's power in your words? Now, this is not a believer. This is just a scientist studying the power of words. Listen to this experiment. So what he did was he, I'm on the wrong page. I was going to tell you all a story about weight loss. Okay, <laughs> wrong story. Okay, so this scientist, he had um, three jars of rice. And what he did was he had one jar that was labeled, thank you. He had another jar that was labeled, you're an idiot. And then the third jar was labeled, nothing. He just left it unlabeled. So here's what he did. He said for 30 solid days, he would speak to the jar based on the label. To the jar that was labeled, thank you, he would speak positive, affirming words. To the jar that was labeled, you're an idiot, he would yell harsh, demeaning words. And then to the, the jar that was unlabeled, he just ignored it altogether. After 30 days of consistent treatment, the thank you jar began to ferment, look appealing, and give off a strong, pleasant aroma. The you're an idiot jar began to rot and mold, giving off a sour milk aroma. The neglected jar just began to rot and mold altogether. Since then, he said other people, homeschoolers, college students, they began to duplicate this experiment and get the same or similar results. So here's my point. If rice can be affected by positive and negative words as well as total neglect, how much more can your circumstances be affected by your words? Think about it like this. Jesus spoke to a fig tree and commanded it to wither up, and it did. You can speak to your metabolism and command it to speed up. You can speak to your body and command it to have energy. You can speak to your marriage and command it to be restored. Speak to your finances, command them to increase. But you have to speak it, right? T.D. Jake says it's not enough to see your dream, you have to speak to your dream. Joyce Meyer says every time you speak it out, you believe it even more. My favorite preacher, Jerry Savelle, he says, see it, say it, seize it. So what I did in 2007, I just made a list of positive declarations because I told you how insecure I was, how confused I was. I made a list of positive declarations that I was going to make myself speak over my body, over my life, over my marriage, over my finances. So I made this list. I put my personal list in here and I would go in my guest bedroom by myself and I felt like a nut. I felt ridiculous, but I saw where successful people do this. So I'm going to do it. So I made this list. And I started declaring, I'm confident because I was insecure. I'm courageous because I was afraid. I'm qualified by God. I said, I'm confident to speak to live audiences. I'm confident to speak on television. I speak at the largest churches and conferences in the nation. I started saying things like, my spirit attracts God-inspired ideas that impact millions of lives and produce millions of dollars. I just started saying this over and over and over every single morning. Consistency is the key to change, right? 
every morning. Like my family would be watching TV, going swimming, and I'd be like, I'm going to go in the guest bedroom and call things that be not as though they already are. I'll be right back. But you know what? Every time you speak it out, you believe it even more. And I'll never forget the day I was in Paris, France, on the front row, getting ready to speak to 10,000 people. And my daughter leaned over to me and she said, Mama, are you a little bit nervous? You know what came out of me? I'm confident, courageous, and qualified by God. I'm confident to speak to live audiences. Why? Because what you repeatedly hear, you eventually believe, right? We can do this, can't we? Okay, so you got it? Confession is number two. You have to speak it out. Let me tell you this scripture real quick. Job 22, 28. It says, thou shalt decree a thing and it will be established for you. And the light of God's favor will shine upon your ways. But you have to decree it. Got it? Okay. My third point, the third C, is continual growth. Continual growth. In fact, let me explain this. Um, How many of you have ever heard of Jim Rohn? He was a famous motivator. He's one of the greatest motivators that ever lived. He's since gone on to be with the Lord. But Jim Rohn, before he was successful, he said he had pennies in his pocket. He had nothing in the bank. He was blaming everybody for where he was in life. He was blaming the government, the economy, his boss. He blamed everybody. Well, one day, this wealthy mentor began to take him under his wing and teach him how to be successful. And he was honest with him. He said, Jim... What you have at this moment in your life, you have attracted by the person you've become. He said, if you don't have much, perhaps you haven't become much. Now, that's pretty offensive, isn't it? And I can understand why he would be offended. So he said he grabbed his paycheck, he held it up to this wealthy man, and he said, you don't understand. He said, this is all they pay. His mentor said, no, this is all they pay you. He said, they pay others more than this. He said, in fact, in your company, they pay others five times this amount. And he said, if you were to qualify for five times this amount, wouldn't your paycheck be five times? Jim said, yeah, I guess so. But then he began to teach him. He said, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. But then he taught him this powerful principle. And if you really hang on to this, it can change your life the way it changed mine. Listen to what he said. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. Do you want me to repeat that? No? Okay. (laughs) Um, I thought it was pretty good. (laughs) No, he said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. If you work hard on yourself, no, he said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. Well, within five years, Jim Rohn became a millionaire. But here's my point. It's not all about becoming a millionaire. It's about changing your life and doing what God's called you to do, right? So that's what happened in my life. You know, I think one of the dumbest things I ever said was when I graduated from Texas Tech, I had my cap and gown on. My family went to El Chico's to celebrate. And we walked in there, and I made the dumbest announcement to my family I think I could ever make. I said, I will never study again. I thought, I've paid my dues. I graduated with honors. I will never pick up another book. Now, here's the sad part. I backed up my dumb promise for 11 years of my life. So for more than a decade, I lived paycheck to paycheck. I had nothing in my savings account. Investments? Never even heard of investments. Um, My house was a mess. I was a mess. I had no vision for my life. I had a five-year-old little girl looking to me for a role model. And you know what my routine was? I would wake up at the last minute to go to work, jump in the car, listen to music, and just sing and dance all the way to the office, work all day. I worked hard on my job. But then when work was over, I'd jump in the car, listen to music, dance all the way home, Get home, turn on the TV, and just watch it for hours and do it again the next day and do it again the next day. And I was more interested in watching other people live their dream than me go after mine for 11 years. Finally, when I hit that rock bottom of my husband and I were separated, I have no money in the bank. I don't even know what I'm doing with my life. And Jesse Duplantis tells me, you work on you. I got desperate for change. 
And I remember I went online to Joyce Meyer's conference or her website, and I bought $60 worth of resources, books and audios. And when I put my credit card in the, you know, on the website, I thought, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I'm spending 60 bucks on faith building resources. And then I started thinking, I would easily spend that on clothing. This is my future we're talking about. My clothes are going to be outdated years from now, but this has the power to transform my entire life. So I started making myself. Um, when I say forcing, it was, a, it was a chore. I started making myself listen to audio messages on my way to work and on my way home. On my way to work, on my way home. I started making myself, just forcing myself to read a book. I would set the alarm on my phone for 20 minutes and I would read, and it was like torture. And then the, the alarm would go off. I'd be like, thank God. But then I'd do it again the next day, and I'd do it again the next day. But y'all, I began to learn that leaders are readers, and the more you learn, the more you earn. And I began to grow myself to where I couldn't get enough. As soon as I'd finish a book, I'd order another book. As soon as I'd finish an audio, I could hardly wait for more audios to show up. Well, can I tell you what happened the next 11 years of my life? I went from ghostwriting books for other people to authoring books. I went from attending conferences to speaking at conferences. I went from watching TV for hours to hosting a TV show. What happened? I finally began to learn, let me just show you this, the key to success, <laughs> which I just happen to have. It's K-E-Y. It stands for keep educating yourself. Keep educating yourself. You got it? Can we do this? I know. I began to learn. Yeah, it's not difficult. We can do this. So, okay, the fourth C, I'm going to go fast. We just got a few minutes together. Um, the fourth C is constant gratitude. Now, I began to learn <clears throat> that a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. And during that season in my life, I heard from Joyce Meyer, not in person, but just listening to her audios. She said, stop looking at everything you've lost and focus on what you've got left and thank God for it. And she said, if you'll start magnifying what you've got instead of magnifying what you've lost, you will open the door for God to do miracles in your life. So I remember I would go down in my kitchen. My husband and I were separated still. I was miserable, but I was starting to learn these habits of success. And I remember I went down in the kitchen at 11 o'clock at night. I was so lonely, so miserable, but I was learning, magnify what you have left. So I would walk around my kitchen and just start quoting Psalm 104, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I would say, Lord, thank you that I have a house. I'm grateful that I still have my house. Lord, I'm grateful that I still have a job. I didn't get fired. I'm still got my job. Lord, I thank you for that little redheaded girl upstairs in her bed. I asked you for a baby and you gave me the desires of my heart. Lord, I thank you for my best friend who I can tell everything to and she still doesn't think I'm a weirdo. Thank you, Lord. I mean, I just started thanking God for everything I had. And y'all, God began to, it was like the heaviness would begin to lift and peace would just come on me. Well, then I started turning it into a lifestyle. I started learning that, in fact, I remember hearing this story about a guy named Joe Vitale. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of him. He's a success coach. But when he was first learning about success, he said that he was so broke, he was living in an apartment in Fort Worth, Texas, back in the early 80s, paying $79 a month. He said he was sleeping on a mattress on the floor, eating off a plastic table and chairs, had no money. But he went to the library and he borrowed a book about success. And the book said, if you want to be successful, be grateful. Start magnifying what you have. It said the more gratitude you express, the more abundance you'll experience. So he said he looked around his apartment. He's like, what do I have to be grateful for? But he kept reading. A grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. So he said he looked at the pencil sitting on his table. And he thought, well, thank you, Lord, that I have a pencil. Because with this pencil, I can write my dreams and goals. I know my chance of success increases if I put my goals in writing. Then he said, thank you, Lord, that I have an eraser. Because with this eraser, I can start erasing my limiting beliefs. He said that moment shifted his entire life. 
he just began expressing gratitude. He's now a success coach to hundreds of thousands, a best-selling author, but he said gratitude is what changed everything. Well, then I heard Oprah Winfrey say, she said, I started journaling my gratitude about 16 years ago, and she said, that is the single most important thing I believe I have ever done. Now, Oprah Winfrey is not my role model, but someone who's worth $3 billion, when they say gratitude is the single most important thing I think I've ever done, I can grab a journal and a pen and start writing my gratitude, can't you? But again, this didn't come from Oprah. This didn't come from Joe Vitale. This came from God's word. He said, be grateful and say so. Don't just think it, speak it, write it, express it. Can we do this? Just start with a grateful heart. Okay, and my fifth and final point is consistent giving. Now, this is a principle that has absolutely changed my life. It's something that I cannot be talked out of no matter what. In fact, my assistant Donna, who's here, she always says, I believe this is what separates you from a lot of people who just write their dreams and goals, they speak affirmations, they try to do all this, but they neglect the giving part. Now, my parents have ingrained this in me, that if you are down to your last $1, don't dare spend it, sow it. Get it in the ground where God can multiply it. And I literally watched my parents give themselves out of poverty. I watched it as a little girl. I watched them go from poverty to prosperity, to being blessed. And they taught me this. They said, if you have a need, sow a seed. Anytime you have a need and you talk to God about your needs, guess what he's going to talk to you about? Your seeds. Because he said the whole earth revolves around the principle of seed time and harvest. So think about it like this. A farmer, I don't know if we have any farmers in here, but you could do exactly what I shared with you today. You could get a dream book. You could, you know, get crystal clear on what you're believing for. I've got a package of basil here. You could even put a picture of basil in your dream book. You could speak to the basil and command it to grow. You could continually grow yourself. You could go to conferences about how to grow basil. You could read books about it and listen to audios. You could be grateful every day. You could write in your journal how grateful you are for basil. But how many of you know you're still never going to have it until what? You sow the seed for it. Well, I've discovered every single dream I have ever seen come to pass in my life I've sown a seed for it, every dream. So just to kind of illustrate this real fast, years ago when my parents were first learning this, they were so broke. My dad was, um, he had just gotten a job with Kenneth Copeland. This is in the early 70s. My parents were living in a house that was just about to be condemned. My mom was wearing cut down maternity dresses from having me two or three years before. Um, They're driving a car with almost 200,000 miles on it. I mean. Life was a mess, but they were learning what I'm sharing with you today. And they knew that God was faithful and he was going to work in their lives. So this is a true story. My dad was getting ready to go with Kenneth Copeland on a trip for three weeks because back then they drove everywhere. So my dad was standing in the front yard and he pulled $3 out of his pocket with tears pouring down his face. He said to my mom, he said, this is all I have. And he said, I feel like a failure as a husband, as a father. This is all I have to give you and the girls for three weeks. But he said, either we trust God or we don't. Somehow, some way, God is going to provide. And my mom said, don't you worry about us. She was a stronger believer than him. She said, don't you worry about us. So my dad left. My mom went to church that night. And when the offering plate came by, my mom had this instant, instant, thought came to her. These $3 do not meet my need, so I'm going to turn it into seed. She took the whole $3 and put it in the offering. Now think about that. $3 doesn't sound like much to us, but to her, it was everything. So she gave the whole $3 that night and said, Lord, I trust you. You said to trust you 365 times in the word of God. That's one for every day you wake up. I trust you, Lord. She went home that very night She was taking her coat off, and when she reached in her pocket, someone had put a $50 bill in her coat pocket that night, and she had no idea. $50 back then was more than enough to take care of us for three weeks. Here's my point. That moment changed my family. 
From then on, any time my parents had a need, they'd say, where can we sow a seed? And that marked me for life. So some of you remember last year, I was sharing how when the pandemic broke out and we were, as a ministry, we're looking at all these things that are canceled and it looks like it's going to be the worst year we could ever have. And God led me to Genesis 26, 12. I don't know if pastors preached on this, but verse one of Genesis 26 says there was a famine in the land, just like the pandemic. But verse 12 says what Isaac chose to do during a famine. It says, Isaac sowed seed in that land, but listen to what it says. And in the same year, he reaped a hundred times as much as he planted. So I told my team, that's our answer. We are not going to suffer during this pandemic. We're going to sow seed just like Isaac did. And we're going to reap in the same year a hundred times what we've sown. So I said, I'm not trying to be goofy, but let's sow 2612 based on Genesis 2612, whether it's $26.12, $26,000. I don't know. I said, we're going to sow 2612. So we sowed our first seed of 2612. Remember the pandemic started in March? The first week of April, my CEO called me and said, Terry, the first week of April surpassed the whole month of March. I said, what? Let's get some more seed in the ground. So we sowed some more seed. And y'all, May broke April's records. June broke that record. 2020 was a record-breaking year for our ministry. So in 2021, we said, let's keep the street going. We gave more than we ever had before. 2021 far surpassed 2020. Y'all, I'm telling you, it is impossible to outgive God. There are three things you can count on when you give to God. You reap what you sow, you reap after you sow, and you reap more than you sow. After, what, and more. You got it? And this is what the Lord told me. Because you know, when you sow your seed, you can have that fear. But the Lord said to me, the moment the seed left your hand, I released what's in mine. Isn't that good? So I wanted to challenge you today. In fact, let me close this out with a little story that I think is so cute. Because this is, this kind of wraps it all together. And this was a story about a father who told his daughter he would spend a Saturday morning just playing with her. Well, Saturday morning came, father ran down to the kitchen table and he's reading the paper. And his little girl came running down super early saying, daddy, you said we could play, let's go play. He said, honey, hold on, let me just read the paper. Well, she was so antsy, she's pulling on his shoulder. He said, honey, hold on. So she, he said, you know what, I'll tell you what I do. He said, there's a picture of the world. I'm gonna tear it into little pieces and put it on the table and you just pretend it's a puzzle and put this picture of the world together. So he goes back to reading his paper She's done like that. He said, how in the world did you put that puzzle together so fast? She said, well, what happened is I dropped a piece. And when I bent down to pick it up, she said, I looked under the glass on the table and on the other side was the picture of a woman. So she said, I just turned all the pieces over. And when I put the woman together, the world just fell into place. (laughs) I thought it was cute. But so my point is, when you put yourself together, your world will start to come together. When you take these five C's, you get clear on what you want. You confess it out of your mouth. You continually grow yourself. Like tonight, some of you are gonna come tonight. I'm gonna share a success principle that businesses had me come teach them last year that transform their businesses. Continually grow yourself. The fourth one, constantly be grateful. Stop complaining and focus on what you have to be grateful for. And number five, Look for opportunities to sow. You got it? Were you encouraged today? Okay. Well, y'all, I apologize for my voice. I believe it's healed in Jesus' name. Y'all believe with me. Um, Yeah, I declare it every single day that God is restoring my vocal cords and my voice in Jesus' name. I used to sound like Joyce Meyer. No, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) But... um, Before we close this out, would y'all stand up for just a minute? I hope you had a good time. I hope you were able to get past the voice and still receive this today. But, you know, I wanted to share this really fast. Years ago, when I was coming out of this hard time, I was out walking one day, and I just heard the Lord say three words. He said, lift your head. I thought, did I really hear that, lift your head? And so I got my phone out, and I wrote that down, lift your head. 
Well, when I got back to the house, I thought, <clears throat> why would God tell me to lift my head? And then I remembered when I was in college, I studied body language. And one of the signs of insecurity, inferiority, low self-esteem is a lowered head. But the number one sign of defeat is the lowered head. And do you know God is so smart, he even put body language in the Bible? <clears throat> There's a scripture, Psalm 3.3. It says, Thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. You're the glory and the lifter of my head. You know what that means? <clears throat> that you should never go a day of your life with your head held down in shame. When Jesus hung on the cross with his head down just so yours could be lifted up. God is telling you today, lift your head. It's time to let go of the past. It's time to pull your shoulders back, lift your head up, and start walking towards your dreams. So I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And if God is speaking to you today through a soft-spoken voice, telling you it's time to lift your head, it's time to get your dreams back, it's time to call on Him to help you do what you could never do on your own, I want you to lift your hands. If you're ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life or recommit your life to Him, to say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you, I need your strength, I need your grace, your power, I need wisdom. Lift your hands. And if you're watching online, this applies to you too. I believe God is speaking to you and I see the hands all over the place. Well, I would love to have the honor to pray with you today. We're all gonna pray this prayer out loud just to seal the deal to make for sure that you have God on your side, Jesus is helping you, and you're not trying to be successful on your own. Are you ready? You ready to make this commitment? Okay, let's open your eyes. Let's lift our hands up all over the place. Let's all repeat that with them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I declare Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for me. I ask you into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. And I declare today, March the 20th is a new beginning. I make my dreams bigger than my memories. In Jesus' name, amen. You got it? Yay! Yes! And those of you who are watching online and you made this commitment, just text Res Yes to 94,000. And oh my goodness, we got people watching online that did this with us. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. My hobby, I'm telling you, my hobby is tormenting the devil. And that's what we just did. So y'all, thank you so much. I love you to pieces. And I'll see you tonight.